All right, so we're in Philadelphia in 1787, and Madison is convinced Washington to give it another go. So Washington shows up along with uh, about 53 other people from around the colony, so 55 altogether, there to essentially create a government out of scratch. And the decision was made very early on to keep the proceedings um, shielded from public attention. So they had to seal up the windows and, and keep people from peeking in and listening to what was going on. So they're in this small wooden building for almost three and a half months in the middle of the summer in Philadelphia. And if, if you've ever been to Philadelphia in summer, it's hot and it's swampy. So they st stuck it out under these um, pretty extraordinary conditions. I want to talk about four different areas in which they had to make decisions, among many, many others, just to give you a sense of how the debate went, uh, what kinds of things they talked about, and how, how they came to the decisions uh, they arrived at. The, the first broad area is this conflict that I mentioned before that had emerged between the large and the small states. Uh, under the Articles, if you recall, each state had only one vote, and this was really not acceptable to the large states who were didn't get as many as much representation per capita as the small states did. But there were enough small states uh, to ensure that it was going to be impossible to get a fully proportional representation in this new government. So, as a compromise, they decided to have one of each, as I'm sure most of you are aware. One of each, so one house in the new legislative body is going to make the large states happy, and that's the House of Representatives, because the number of representatives that one that each state gets is based on population. And the other uh, is the Senate, and the Senate is going to make the small states happy because everybody's going to get two, no matter how many people you have. So just to give you an example of how this works out today, California has 53 representatives in the House. Of course, there was no California in 1789 when this was um, went into effect. But today, California has 53 people in the House of Representatives, and Wyoming has just one. Uh, but we both have two, and this uh, arrangement makes our upper chamber, our Senate, one of the most malapportioned uh, legislative bodies in any of the uh, liberal democracies. It's a, it's a pretty extraordinary situation. So... You know, we have 39 million people in California, of course, so that means each of our two senators represents almost 20 million people, whereas in Wyoming they have 600,000 people, so they each represent 300,000. So obviously the state of Wyoming has a lot more representation, a lot more influence per capita in the Senate than California does. But it's worth mentioning that the, the at this point, even the House is very malapportioned. So each of our 53 people represents about 765,000 um, people, I believe, uh, to Wyoming's 600,000. And that's because we capped the number of representatives in the House at the beginning of the 20th century to be 435. So you can't go above that, and the states with large populations end up getting more and more uh, malapportioned, or they get less and less representation as there are more people. Before I leave this, though, I want to mention one more issue that was uh, on the table and very important, uh, and that was uh, the question of slaves when it came to the House, and specifically, um, when you're counting people, uh, in determining how many representatives your state is going to have, do slaves count? Of course, the South, uh, which had, in some cases, uh, almost 50% of their population were slaves, 
The South said, yes, of course, they should count. Um, the North uh, called them on their hypocrisy and said, no, they shouldn't. Give me a break. You don't even think they're people. Uh, how can they count for the purposes of population? In the end, as many of you, I'm sure, know, they did compromise on this. And they came up with what is called the Three-Fifths Compromise. Um, so that uh, one person, one slave would count as three-fifths of a person, or you could think five slaves amount to three people for the purposes of counting population. Now, this doesn't mean that slaves were going to have a vote or be citizens or anything like that. It just means that when you're counting bodies uh, for the purposes of representation, you know, do you count those? Um, now, one can certainly ask the question, why did the North end up compromising on this? Why, why did they compromise? Because clearly they, their position was um, pretty sound. This was a pretty hypocritical stance for the South to take. Well, the reason that they compromised was very simple, and that was that the representatives in Philadelphia, they wanted this um, to, they wanted this to pass. And if the, they had not agreed to count slaves for the purposes of counting population, the South would have ended up with only 35% of the seats in the House. And um, and if they tried to go back to their uh, respective citizens in the South and say, you know, you should vote for this. And they said, well, how is it set up in the legislative branches? They said, well, we only have a third of the seats. They were pretty sure that nobody would have supported it. When they shifted to 45%, which is uh, the, uh, when they shifted to the three-fifths compromise, I mean, what ends up happening is that the number of the percentage of the seats that the South gets goes to 45%. And they thought, they were pretty sure that they would be able to sell this um, to their citizens in the South if they could say that they got 45% of the seats. So that's essentially why we have uh, two houses. Now, once they decided this issue of... Um, uh, the composition of the um, okay so now that they've decided that, that this new legislative body is going to include uh, two houses and they decide that by the end of by the end of May they turn to questions about how these new legislative offices are going to be elected and the first uh, topic for discussion is how the house members are going to be elected they, the proposal is quickly made that they be directly elected uh, by the people. That's one of the first proposals made. And it's met with a lot of opposition. Uh, and one of the things that I want to stress in this discussion is that the delegates in Philadelphia were not there really to empower uh, the average citizen. This was really not uh, in, you know, an instance of trying to promote... Uh, direct democracy in a, in any widespread sense, was, their understanding of democracy was was quite different. Um, so, for instance, when the proposal was made that the House members be directly elected, some of the delegates stood up and said things like, "Well, we couldn't possibly elect allow the average citizen to vote because they don't know anything, and they would clearly make mistakes." And other people stood up and said, "Well, you know, we." Uh, they're so gullible that they'll sell their vote to the highest bidder, and we can't permit that. There were, though, a couple of speeches that were influential in, um, in uh, you know, the outcome, which was that they would be directly elected. One was a speech by, made by Franklin, and he said, well, if you, you know, you want to think about how our citizens are going to behave when we, when, if we give them this right, look to our citizen soldiers. He said, you know, we just fought a war against Great Britain, and uh, in that war we saw many British soldiers trying to sell their service to us. Um, 
but we didn't see any of our soldiers trying to sell their service to the British. Why was that? He said, well, they were, knew they were fighting for themselves. They were fighting on their own behalf. He said, if you treat citizens like citizens, they will behave as citizens. Madison made a speech as well in favor of direct election of the House members, but his was a little bit different. What he said was that if at least one of these offices is not directly elected by the people, then the people will not think of this government as, them, as their own. And the long-term survival of this new framework of government uh, de was dependent upon the people thinking of it as their own. Now, one, one thing to point out about this is that it's quite a departure from anything that's gone before. Under the Articles of Confederation, the, each state had one vote, and those representatives in the legislative branch, well, they were chosen by the state legislatures. So the, the central government under the Articles was essentially a government comprised of states, right? But what Madison is proposing is that citizens, that the people have representation in the government. People from all the different states have direct representation in the government, this new central government. That was quite unlike anything that had gone before. And it's part of the reason that later, um, when the Senate, the Senate, when they, well, let me just say first, when they turn their attention to the Senate, they decide that the Senate is going to be indirectly selected by the state legislatures, uh, just like it was under the Articles of Confederation. So there's not a direct election. Uh, the state legislators chose the senators. When later on, when we revise this to provide for a direct election, uh, and we do that in 1913, many years later, uh, the opposition to that is based on the idea that, this, that the states will no longer have representation in the federal government. And... Um, and so we essentially, in 1913, sort of made the Senate like the House in that it's a representation of, of people. So it's quite, uh, you know, this idea is quite a new idea in 1787. But this is what they do. So the direct election is confined to the House, and the Senate is going to be indirectly elected, um, chosen by the state legislators. The t attention then turns to the term of office, and... The, you know, when, now that they have decided that the House is going to be directly elected, uh, there's no way that this is going to be a long term of office. So the argument quick, quickly turns to the sense that, well, if, if we're going to allow the people to directly elect House members, we need to make sure the term's really short, just in case they make a mistake, so that they can fix it quickly. So two years. And they, they decided on that, I think, at the beginning of June. So very early in the in the convention. Now when they turn to the question of the Senate and the term of office of the senators, it's in the it's in with the understanding that they're going to be indirectly elected, or indirectly chosen by the state legislators. And so there's a sense that the term should be longer, that this is going to be a body in which the people selected are going to have a sort of a a, a longer term outlook. They're not going to be so uh, swayed by local concerns or by uh, short-term considerations. It's one argument is, is proposal, actually, is that they be uh, selected for life. Uh, Hamilton proposed that. Madison was holding out for nine years. They eventually settle on six years. Um, so that's why the Senate's term is much longer. This is what they talked about at the convention. They next turn to the question of property qualifications. Are the people voting for House members going to have to own property before they can vote? Um, they one uh, delegate at the con at the uh, convention, John Adams, argued strenuously that there should be property qualifications because he argued that you know really the only fit citizen is one who. Um, owns property. They're the only ones with something at stake. They eventually des they decided not to put pro property qualifications in, 
uh, mostly because they wanted to just to leave it up to the state governments. So a lot of the states at the time already had property qualifications. You couldn't vote unless you owned some property or, or paid a certain amount of taxes, depending on what state you lived in. So these are some of the issues around the legislative branch. Let me move forward. Okay, now we can... Oops, sorry. Find the next slide. Now another set of issues they had to tackle was what the executive branch would look like and how would they be elected. Remember, under the Articles of Confederation, there was no executive branch. Um, and, and this was seen as one of the major uh, problems. When they discussed uh, the executive, however, a lot of the attention turned to the uh, executive's role in foreign policy. And uh, the, really the, the main debate which was between whether there would be a, a chief executive uh, in a single person who, who might be called a president that was proposed at various points, or whether there would be a council of people. Madison's proposal was for three people who together would be the executive power. There were a couple of reasons that they ended up uh, kind of settling on the idea of a single person. One was was that, um, you know, in, in the arena of foreign policy, the, the, really the model that they had was strong executives, uh, you know, kings. And the idea that one could send a council of people, maybe three people walking arm in arm to sit down and meet with the king, uh, seemed ridiculous uh, to some of the people at the convention. And so there was a strong sense that there needed to be a single person who could carry the, um, the, uh, the uh, agenda of the United States in an undis undivided way to another chief executive was one of the reasons that they settled on the idea that it would be a single person and not a group of people. Clearly, though, from the writings of people who were at the convention, it was, it was the, the decision was also um, influenced by the presence of George Washington. There was a sense that, that everybody that was there kind of knew that Washington would be the first one that they would select. And, you know, much of their concern centered around the, the, the fear that if they did settle on one person, that that person would crown themselves king and sort of take away uh, the, uh, the electoral power. Now, everybody knew George Washington, his, and they knew that of all the people um, uh, on earth, George Washington would be, would be really the last person to crown himself king. So they could feel, they could sort of rest assured that that wouldn't happen if Washington was in fact selected as the first uh, president. Um, but there was also there were also people there. It was clear that um, when it came to the question of the term of office, you know, they didn't put anything in there. There was so they decided on a single person. Uh, they did not put any language um, about the term limit. They decided on four years as the term, uh, but they didn't put any language in there about a limit, and. Uh, some historians have argued that this is partly because some of the delegates thought that when they selected a president, so if they selected Washington, for, his, for instance, Washington would serve for the rest of his life. And then when he passed away, they would select someone else who would then in turn serve until, the, until they died. Um, and so when Washington uh, stepped down after two terms, he was met with a lot of opposition. People said, no, 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 you, you, wait a minute. We didn't intend for you to step down. So they didn't put a term limit in, and there's some suggestion that that's, that's what people had in mind, that they would serve actually for very, very long terms. The other question was how that person would be elected. Now, the convention went, came back into this many, many times. They had a very hard time coming up with a decision on this. Uh, one suggestion was that they be directly elected by the people. That was 
going nowhere. I mean, if they couldn't even agree that the senators would be going to be directly elected, there was no way that this convention was going to agree that the chief executive would be uh, selected by the people. So another suggestion was that they be selected by Congress, uh, which is par the parliamentary model. That was what was already happening in Great Britain. It was what they were familiar with in terms of the prime minister, of course, not the, not the, not the king, but the prime minister. Uh, but they said, well, we don't really, we want to do something different than, we don't want to be like Great Britain. So some people suggested maybe that they be selected by the states, just as, in the same way that the senators were going to be. Uh, but the, that was met with the criticism that they didn't want this new federal government to be controlled by the states. It was supposed to be um, uh, controlled by Congress. So they really were having a hard time coming up with any answer to this question. Finally, in September, so they've already been there for you know more than three months, someone suggests something that's called an electoral college. And the electoral college is going to be um, people that are selected by the state legislatures who would then uh, vote on who the president would be and if... Uh, Nobody managed to get 50% of all the electors to agree that the election would move into the House of Representatives and there would be one vote per state. Now, by this time, the delegates were so exhausted. They wanted this to pass. They wanted to get out of there. They couldn't come up with anything else, and so they agreed. Ah, that sounds great. Let's, okay, let's do the Electoral College. Now, as a measure of just how difficult this decision was, they put the language in there. I mean, that paragraph that describes the Electoral College is one of the most convoluted and difficult paragraphs you will ever find. Um, and it's clear that a lot of the delegates didn't really understand it either because it was actually technically incorrect. It produced a tie especially in the race of 1800, one of the most contentious uh, elections. I just The language just did not work. And so they amended the Constitution in uh, 1803 to, to actually fix um, the Electoral College language. Now, we still have, of course, the Electoral College. That's how we select the president. But it works very differently than it was understood by the people who wrote it into the Constitution. We haven't amended it or anything like that since the beginning of the 19th century, but it works very different, and I'll talk about that later when we talk about uh, elections. The final set of issues I would like to bring to your attention are those that were in, involved in the conflict between northern and southern states. It was a very contentious set of issues. Uh, they would bring these issues up and then couldn't come to an agreement, table them, come back to them later, couldn't agree, table them. Uh, the northern and the southern states were quite different than one another. We're all familiar with that. The north, for instance, um, made up of merchants, uh, factory owners of pre-industrial pre economy. They haven't quite... Uh, reach the Industrial Revolution. They can't make things as cheaply as Great Britain. They haven't achieved the same economies of scale, but they're on their way, and so they're 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 makers. Now the South, though, is is really an agricultural economy. There's some trade, and uh, of course it's of course based on a foundation of slave slave labor. Now the North comes to the table with certain kinds of demands about the economic powers that Congress is going to have. The North wants Congress to be able to tax imports. Now, why is this important to the North in particular? Well, it's because the North uh, is trying to compete with Great Britain. And uh, if they can tax imports coming from Great Britain, they can make their products relative to the more expensive so that people will buy the things that are made in the north. It's a form of protectionism. It's sort of like putting tariffs on or import taxes so that 
people don't buy things made in China today. Uh, they also wanted uh, to make sure that Congress had the ability to dictate that trade into and out of the United States be on U.S.-owned ships. Now, this was what was called the Navigation Acts. Um, it, it's, it's hard to imagine how important this was back, back in the day because we don't think of that anymore. But, but most of the ships were owned by people from the North and especially people from New York, and it was very, extremely lucrative if you could uh, get control over uh, whose ships the stuff was going to be tra traded in. Now, when it came to the economy, um, the South wanted Congress not to be able to tax exports. They wanted that written into the Constitution, that Congress would not be able to tax exports. Now, similarly, why would the South be so interested in this? Well, it was because they exported a lot of the stuff that they grew and that they, um, uh, and that they uh, also that they found in some cases. They were an export economy, and if Congress taxed the exports that they sent abroad, it would make them more expensive to their customers, and they might lose some market share. And so between these two, of course, these are very difficult to compromise. There's not much middle ground before between these two. And, um, you know, when they were discussing these things, they were ha having a hard time finding any kind of compromise. Another set of issues, though, had to do with the slave trade. And this, some of the delegates from the North wanted to ban the importation of slaves from Africa. Um, and the South, of course, wanted to keep um, slavery and the importation of sl slaves. Uh, now, they didn't want Congress to be able to ban those things. Now, the issue of slavery itself, I wrote this here, but the issue of slavery itself was never really on the table. No one ever thought that there could ever be an agreement on the Constitution that banned slavery. The, the South would have clearly have just walked out, um, would have ended. So it was never, but the issue of importing slaves uh, was pushed at the convention. Now, what happens at the convention is a really good example of lawmaking in general, of the compromise that sometimes is required in order to uh, make progress on laws. And it's a good example also of the analogy, um, if you've ever heard of law, compared to uh, sausage making. It's, you end up with some, something you kind of like, but you don't really want to see how it's made. Um, lawmaking is something sometimes like that. And in order to make progress on these seemingly unrelated issues of uh, exports and imports and slave, the slave trade, they um, had to include all of them. Now, let me just illustrate what I mean. One way that you can think about this is to um, assign each one of these positions a letter. Let's say that this, is a, this position here is a big C because it's a strong... Um, it's a it's a strong trade position. It gives Congress a lot of power. So we're going to call this a big C, and we're going to call this one over here a little C. Fairly weak uh, power. Congress doesn't have very much power over commerce. Now this one we're going to call a small S because it's going to weaken uh, slavery. This one we're going to call a big S. The position is to have a strong position on slavery. And when you're understanding how this ends up happening, um, you can uh, analyze these this decision making by using a simple model. Let's ask the question, let's, let's assume that instead of deciding these separately, are we going to tax imports or not tax exports, let's assume that we're going to do it together and we're going to have a pair of um, preferences. And we can ask the question for the North, what is their top preference? In terms of a, of a commerce position and a slave position, what would their top preference be? Well, the, the top combination for the South, the most preferred policy combination, is a big C and a little s, right? And then you can move to their second position, because what we're doing in negotiation is we're trying to find 
areas of agreement, right? Their second most preserved, pre preferred policy position, again, is with a big C, but paired with a big S. Because this, the North would really, you know, they would rather, you know, imports are much more important. Um, so they're willing, so, this, so, the, so the big S is their second preferred. And then when you move to the third, then you have to move to little c, right? Little c paired with a little s. And then their, their least preferred policy combination, a little c and a big s, right? And you can do the same thing for the south, right? What is their number one policy uh, preference? Well, hopefully you've seen that it's a little c and a big s. So for the south... Keeping slavery in the slave trade is much more important than anything else on the table. And you might notice right off the bat, that is the opposite, right? That's the least preferred policy combination for the North. So no wonder they're having such a hard time coming to an agreement. All right, let's, let's then look at their second preference. Well, for the South... Uh, the second preference is a big C and a little S, a big C and a big S. Slavery again, most important, and so they would so so the big C um, is paired with that most important preference, and you'll notice, of course, this is the uh, this is where the area of agreement is. Now, like I said, on these issues, they had been going back and forth. Um, for months on these questions, considering them separately. Economy, one day, maybe a couple days later, the slave trade, and then go back to economy. But there was a moment in August, in the third week in August, when um, uh, there's an important uh, exchange that takes place. When uh, someone from the North notices that the Virginia delegation is actually arguing with people from, the, from South Carolina and Georgia. And people from South Carolina and Georgia are saying, well, it's all well and good for you, Virginia, to give up the slave trade. We have swamps, and our, our slaves die in the swamps, and so we have to import slaves. But yours manages to survive, and so we'll end up having to purchase slaves from you, which we don't want to do. Now, somebody from the North picked up on that and said, Wow, I didn't realize how hard it was for you, South Carolina and Georgia. Maybe we need to reconsider this opposition to the slave trade, the importation of slaves. Now, with that little give to for, for our expression of um, empathy from the from the north to the south, um, there was uh, a moment when this people from the South said, oh, the uh, people from the North, maybe they understand us. And uh, the governor of Pennsylvania at that moment says, oh, well, maybe these things may form the basis of a bargain among us. And they take it and send it to a committee and come back with an agreement. Now, what it, what, Governor Morris from Pennsylvania might have realized is this precisely this possibility of moving to their second choice. Both parties moving to their second most pop, um, their second preferred policy combination as a way to move things ahead. It was almost as if Governor Morris had a light bulb go off in his head. So they went off and um, sent it to a committee. And the committee came back and proposed um, giving Congress the ability to tax imports at the same time that the slave trade would be kept in to the agreement. Now, it didn't end there, so that, that represents, of course, this position here. But it didn't end there. Um, once this agreement was was reached, um, there was a kind of a, almost like a spirit of, um, you know, mutual camaraderie or something like that. And there was an agreement that, well, if also um, 
if we agree to um, prohibit Congress from taxing exports, that um, South Carolina and Georgia will, with Virginia, try to figure out a way to um, make it not so onerous on South Carolina and Georgia to have to import slaves, and maybe drain the swamps or, or you know, figure out a trade agreement between Virginia and not, not so, South Carolina and, North, and Georgia. And they agreed, okay, uh, as long as you uh, agree that Congress will not have the ability to tax exports, we'll agree that um, in 1808, Congress uh, can ban uh, the importation of slaves. And we'll write that in. It was almost like, for the delegates there, it was almost like Christmas, because they ended up getting uh, this as well, which is the third policy preference, the small c, no taxing of exports, that goes in there as well. And um, so does, in some, in some means, the banning of the slave trade. I don't know who came up with the idea of 1808, right? But, but putting that date in there and saying, well, well, we won't ban it now, but we'll agree that Congress can ban it in 1808, moved everything forward. So that um, sort of all four of these positions end up being in the final bill. I mean, in the final, in the final uh, Congress, in Constitution. This is the way lawmaking often happens. So, for instance, people argue, people criticize Congress sometimes, and they say, well, why are these unrelated things in this bill? Um, and it betrays kind of a, um, um, a naivete about the way the lawmaking process happens. Lawmaking is almost never a situation in which there is one policy on the table, both sides come, they debate it, they come to some kind of an agreement, everybody is in, in consensus about it, and then the law is passed about that one issue. M much more often, in order for uh, an agreement to, uh, to take place and for a law to be passed, there's a negotiation among uh, issues that are uh, somewhat unrelated. And this is a facet of lawmaking that's, that's uh, um, crucial to the success quite often. And we'll later in the semester look at some other examples of this. So I want to just point this out. So make sure that you know, you know what, what ended up going into the Constitution and some idea about why that is. All right.